Hey, Eventpreneurs, it's Austin Johnston, and I just wanted to sign on this week for a very special subject that's near and dear to everyone's heart, especially right now, and that is new business, business development, and shaping your client spectrum of who you work with often. And always recognizing relationships that you might not have explored the depth or breadth of. And so we're going to explore how to grow your business, especially in the economy like now, we can expect for the next, let's say, two years. Really new business is something that we get asked about a lot. At every keynote, even in a good economy, I'm telling you, it's a subject that matters. I know that you're here for that reason. So let's get in there with new business, old business, and growing your business with clients and projects. I get asked a lot how you grow a company, how you grow business. And when I started the company when I was 21 years old, one thing that I really felt strongly about was that good work speaks for itself. Reputation-based, Client referral based uh, uh, leads are really the most powerful tool that you're going to have to grow, scale, and otherwise you know, expand what you're already doing. And the reason why I feel so passionate about that is because when I was 21, nobody really trusted me to execute these larger campaign events, right? And so you look at that referral as not only an introduction, like a business card, but it's also an introduction and it's an editorial review because you're getting the trust and endorsement of somebody that you mutually know who referred that person, and that's speaking for itself. So you've got to understand that referrals carry more weight than most other business uh, 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 angles and, and networking areas because really you're gaining the, uh, the advantage of a review, somebody that they already trust, and that's something that's very, very hard to replace. Now we're going to discuss a few pillars that you guys can, can lean into, things that you can invest time into and explore and have conversations, but truthfully, this comes down to a conversational and relationship-oriented uh, uh, engagement uh, on all levels, really. And so we're going to explore how you can kind of push behind that to really expand your, what you already have. Maybe you already know people that are clients. They just haven't explored that deep enough. So I want to break down really the types and categories of clientele that you will have and types of business like clientele. And the first one, first and foremost, is what you already have now or else you wouldn't be here, and that is called old business from old clients, right? And these are those tried and true opportunities that you rely on annually to kind of carry you and that you're really not working that hard for. These are things you've already done, executed, worked on, and understand like the back of your hand, right? And the reality is these old opportunities are really important. And one thing that you need to remember is that you need to continually invest in every opportunity, right? And oftentimes, event planners especially can be made into fools by kind of neglecting their, their most tried and true client, right? So one thing I want you guys to start out with is something you're not really investing a lot of time into, or maybe you are, uh, and that is investing in your existing clients. Again, old business from old clients, because these reliable nuggets of business, these Easter eggs that you can find tucked away into your deck of, oh, hey, we did that every year. Well, don't get too casual because right now, the sharks are circling, right? There's blood in the water, and there's not a lot of water, there's not a lot of food right now. So you have all these people that are gonna be poaching these clients, offer them higher levels of service, different levels of service. So somebody that doesn't offer the ability to go digital or remote, they're gonna be exploring options. So understand that the first piece of business growth and business growth advice I'm gonna give you is that old business from old clients isn't something that's just gonna grow on trees, especially right now. When the market is impacted and the market is depressed or recessed, you're going to find people that are exploring opportunities and you're going to also see turnover. So when you have old business from old clients, that's great. But now more than ever, you need to touch base with those people in multiple contexts of this company. You need to pollinate all those different accounts by visiting them, following up on them, checking on them. And really human moments right now are speaking volumes, right? So again, old business from old clients is your first checkpoint that I want to make sure that you guys keep yourself in check on because that business could go away if you're not paying attention and investing constantly in opportunities that you believe to be solid and just baked into your mix. I mean, everyone understands they have a deck of clients and opportunities that they plan on getting every year without contest. So I know nobody here at all tuned in to, for me to talk about how you can get business from old clients, right? That's certainly not why we're all here. We're talking about new opportunities, more money, expand and grow what you're already doing, right? One thing I want to talk about, though, are these same old clients or same old accounts that you're working on. I want you to explore two things. And the first is going to be asking clients, exploring what else they do, right? If you're on the annual shareholder meeting, 
and you find out they have other departments in the company or in the organization that you're representing, what other engagements are they involved in that you can assist with? Whether it be a virtual event that you can help them host, whether it be uh, vetting uh, uh, speakers or figuring out how you can support them on a more grand scale within departments that you don't serve. If there's a thousand people in the organization and you're only in with one department of one division at one office, there's probably going to be a larger opportunity among other teams, because typically companies, some of them, a large, a large part of them, are, are driven by team-oriented uh, building, right? So at IBM, for instance, there are teams of IBM that have vendors that nobody else uses for anything else but their annual Inspired Connect Summit that's in Las Vegas or whatever, hypothetically speaking, right? Reality is IBM as a client is, is far more vast than that. Right. But exploring those opportunities by asking for introductions that you like, say, hey, you know, I know we do this in summer, but what else do you guys do in fall and winter? Are there other teams that you've interfaced with that you can introduce me to? So I can at least just show them what we do, as well as pivot off of pivot off the successes that you draw in that department into a valid referral from client to client, even though it's internal. It might still be IBM, but you're getting a legitimate referral from the street from Carol over in Watson over to John over in Aspire. And these business units very much act like different clients in themselves. So really think about that. So should government, nonprofit, they all work similarly. And it's very surprising when you find that. And I think if you guys make a couple actionable and really memorable calls or emails or, or out outreach, you're gonna find yourself have limited resistance to find these new clients in these old organizations that already trust you. You're already a vendor. And they already know the level and you already know that the quirks, there's always quirks. Every client is challenging for different reasons, right? Organizational quirks, right? This is something that you know and you're familiar with. So this is the least resistance new client that you're going to go out there and get. Now, separately, I don't want to talk about the word pivot because I hate it. I've learned to hate it in the past 60 days. I'll tell you that right now. And I hope that you have learned to embrace that word in a negative sense. I want to talk about diversification. Okay. Diversification is exactly like the word pivot, except for pivoting, in my opinion, underscores your profession, right? So whatever you're really great at, you can't just throw it all away because the economy is terrible, right? You can't just be a, uh, an electrician and then nothing goes electrical so you become a plumber. You're not gonna be the expert in that overnight, right? Diversification is using skills that you already possess to go ahead and, 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 and offer something greater or different than what you've already done. For instance, what our company does with a print house, a fabrication shop, and a lot of driven individuals that can do a lot of good is we package things. So what we did for FX Networks and Hulu is we recently were onboarded to create a cast and crew premiere for a new TV show that premiered. And since we couldn't do anything with contact, it's the peak of the COVID craziness, we actually created these special kits that went to all cast and crew at their homes and they were able to celebrate this launch with a really fun kind of in real life moment in their living room. And they were able to draw that back to visual references from the actual TV show. This exciting build was something that we were able to kind of diversify ourselves into because we already understood how to deliver a campaign like that without having to pivot and completely depart from our business model, right? We still consulted the client. We're able to bill four figures out of that, which again, wasn't the year, but for 40 people to hit a four figure billable was pretty nice. And to be honest with you, it only took about a day and a half to do. So think about what diversified offerings that you can have or partnerships that you can create with even competitors of yours or production companies to really find that jam where you can really synergize with something else that you can monetize. Because right now, monetizing your services is not fully realized, right? You can't fully realize the, the capacity of an event planner. What they got for $10,000 uh, last season was certainly different than what they can get $10,000 now. And that can go both ways, either great or terrible, right? But by you diversifying your offerings, you're finding what they're looking for, which is what can we still do? And you're taking that money and saying, I can do that very well. And that's really important for you. So find ways to diversify yourself. So we've touched on old business from old clients, more business from old clients, and now we're gonna talk about new business from old clients. And that's the good old fashioned referral, right? These people that have worked with you in a professional capacity and have come to engage with your company on a professional level to assume your services, right? Now, how do you stand out when that client is running into the woods doing their regular thing and they're out with friends having cocktails? How do you stand out as a vendor that really makes a difference, right? 
what I've found is, is, is better than just doing a good job. Because doing a good job should be what you're focused on in your day-to-day, -day, nine to five, right? But after hours, I wanna make sure that you guys all stand out. So think about what you are doing and ask yourself really, really critically, what am I doing to make myself stand out? And I tell this to clients a lot when we're actually strategizing on a brand level. So if we're launching a new product, like let's say we're launching this new beer, right? You wanna make sure that you're aligning yourselves with what this beer is supposed to be. Is it cool? Is it amazing? Is it refreshing, right? What tones, like what is your mood board for your brand, right? And how do you translate that emotion beyond a boundary of profession, of that nine to five profession that, you pay, that they pay for your service, right? And you can do that through getting cocktails with somebody, maintaining a great Instagram. But truthfully, the way that you're gonna stand out is if, they, if you're aligned with that client in some capacity. And to be honest with you, as one might guess, I know everyone's cup of tea, but I've got a great broad team here that really can tap into the right client for the right speed, right? Everyone's gotta kind of speak that same language. And unfortunately in smaller organizations with one principal planner and a couple support people, you not being somebody's cup of tea is gonna be a much greater problem. Whereas for us, we can act more prescriptive in our approach to that's the right person for that opportunity and connect those dots. But the problem that I face as a larger company that has producers and coordinators that are on staff is that how do I get them to fall in love with my brand? And the reality is for me, I face a much bigger challenge because if that associate, producer, whoever leaves, how is the business not gonna follow them out the door? And similarly for you, the benefit that you might have in leading a larger or independent or planning organization is when you leave, the clients might follow you. But as you build an organization, you're gonna flip sides, right? And so what I always think about is how can I make my brand approachable, likable, relatable, and emotional where my clients go, I love the AK Johnston brand, I don't just love the producers there. And by using positive corporate culture, our client and employee retention is, is quite strong. So you keep that ecosystem alive where people can tap into it, consume as they need to, and then look at you from an outsider's perspective, they go, that is a great ecosystem. And here are the reasons why I love it, right? From the energy, the tone, even the weirdness of your brand, that brand that's simply you and your you really, what you're bleeding, your organization, that's where the secret sauce is, right? So make an organization that stands on its own without you a part of it, without a producer a part of it, because that is the brand that you need to build. Building that brand is going to allow those old clients that think about you after nine to five, make genuine referrals in the street, and again, make new people fall in love. People will evangelize your brand if they love the brand itself. And whatever product they put out, just like when an Apple product launches, there's always a line. Why is there a line? I personally don't know, but I get it because the brand is sexy. People want it. They want to, they want to consume all of it, right? They'll be the first person to have the new blank, right? And they could drop anything and people wait in line for it. And that's kind of secret sauce of getting new business from old clients. So we're just talking about making sure that your organization is the desirable mass that people are kind of flocking to. That's so important because if people love your brand, they will evangelize it, right? And one thing that I can focus on for you guys when attracting new business from new clients is that you need to learn to embrace when people quit or get fired from an organization. And here's why. If you've done a good job of talking to that organization, the original organization they were a part of, and making sure that other people know about you, other departments know about you and their whole team so when Carol leaves, she's got a whole team of people that are still working there. Not only are you more seated in that organization because you're there the longest, right? You're the vendor that has been there for five years. Uh, other associates have been there for only three. They're gonna keep using you. A lot of strength in that. Now you have a, a bigger voice in that conversation now moving forward. Now, this hypothetical Carol then moves to a new organization, right? That allows you to open up new business opportunities because Carol knows you, trusts you, now, wherever she's at, you can follow. And at her old organization, all of her people that used to report to her now kind of report to you. I've actually had situations where clients are looking to me to give them the backlog of data behind what this annual event did, how it ran, how to kind of do that. And by offering that level of support, you really get a chance to introduce yourself to that new team. And of course, Carol, who's now the new organization, becomes a brand new client for you. That's an extremely powerful thing that again, You've got to make your organization likable, not just you, not just your people. Because if your people are likable, they could leave. The retention strategy behind that becomes very ugly, sticky, and might involve an attorney. 
So again, make sure that you are spread across your clients to where they all know who you are. And again, embrace when somebody leaves an organization because that really could be good for you. Like a splitting atom, you can now have multiple clients. Now, that's not to say that it's uh, different than an OG, original gangster style referral. The way it works is that you just do a good job, here's the guy's number, and just do work with him. Now that's great, but your network's simply recommending you, there's not really advice for that, okay? My only advice to you is that people purchase based off of emotion, right? And people interact based off of emotion. If they feel good about it, if people feel uh, excited, empowered, cool, sexy, skinny, uh, strong, whatever, whatever you want to evoke, it's typically an emotional feeling, right? So you got to think about you as, an, as a person and your, and your company as an organization. Are you aligning yourself properly with the vibe that you want to evoke? We briefly touched on that earlier, but I want you to really examine that. Again, make sure that the feeling from your company resonates what you want them to feel when they're making decisions. When they're making decisions and it's apples to apples, they're going to go with what they feel better about, right? And that's how humans respond to emotion. And that's the whole base of experiential marketing is the fact that people want an emotional connection to be forged between them and a product through a physical experience, right? So because of that, lean into the reason why our business model even works and why it's functional and work with that because you're no different, right? At the end of the day, we are all our own client because we're selling a service or a product or what have you, right? So that's very important. Now, Two other points of new business from new clients. And the first is the paid referral. The paid referral is something that's very, very scary. And when we do our fabrication business, we do have a lot of paid referral people, which agencies will come to us and expect 10%, 20% off, or 5%, 10% commissions on our a referral type people. And that's a little bit scary because it can be referred to by some industry folks as a little bit on the outside of what they're okay with. Because you're basically admitting that you're marking something up a significant figure, to just push it through. So be careful about that. But you could easily outline a commission strategy. So we have a pro forma template that outlines what our partner, we call it partner commissions, what we're willing to offer. And our, and our first offer is really scaled because quite honestly, as you might know, your margins will go uh, horribly down the higher the number, right? You're not gonna be making a 50% margin on a $2 million project, You're just not, right? Unless I'm crazy. Um, at the same time, too, a 50% margin out of a producer fee uh, uh, seems actually low to me. You should be monetizing most of that uh, uh, billable uh, uh, people hours, right? So you really got to think about that. You can offer me 5 and 15% is typically what I've seen. I'm in no way recommending that value to you. But a 5 to 15% commission, or if you're referring, let's say, an audiovisual partner on your client's jobs, you can ask for a referral business that way and kind of, um, I guess celebrate that business a little bit more by getting 5%, 10% on the top. I know a lot of party rental companies typically do that. I think largely in North America, uh, they're all offering those kind of referrals or an industry discount. But by offering that to partners to bring you in, it would be a hotel client or what have you, that's not a terrible idea. Now, of course, there's a threatening referral. Now, I jokingly call it the threatening referral, but that's what I do most. And that is where I have an opportunity in my wheelhouse that has nothing to do with me. And I typically like to bring on partners that I believe I can get value out of later. And it's not a manipulative strategy, but simply that if there's three vendors that offer a service and one vendor we have better relationship, refer that vendor. Typically, uh, people want that, that, that bilateral referral thing and it almost never pans out. So I look at that person I'm about to give a $5,000 or $20,000 referral to and I say, could they, would they ever bring me something? And that's why I make my selection. If it's a matter of A, B, or C, I find the one that I believe is going to most likely come to me with something and, and, and respect that. And I typically don't collect on those. In fact, I don't think I've ever collected on those where it's just been, look, what, what can I get you back on? I usually say, when I come knocking, you'll know. Or if we do like a party that's internal for AK Johnston and we ask that partner, hey, do you mind supporting us? I've had caterers promote my entire event because we've referred a half million dollars in catering just in a very short period of time. But usually getting those relationship-based back and forth, that's what I like. Because really that's how you keep that community involved. That's how we keep our partners happy and our, par our partners healthy. That way they can do the best work possible for me when I come around. Or if I come in a week out and I should have been planning three months out, they kind of tend to drop more for me 
than somebody else. And that's a really, really, really important thing in my opinion to me. So now a question that I get asked a lot of is about advertising. A lot of people want to do some kind of a targeted campaign or they really just want to figure out a more traditional means of going after new business. And I'm convinced personally, it's a personal opinion that this industry is very hard to advertise against because there's so much that goes into it and it's such a relationship based thing. It's all based on communication and what's important. You know, everyone always outlines what's important to them as a client, right? So I don't believe that advertising in a more traditional sense is really appropriate, right? Now, I would say that your broadcast channel, I mentioned this in previous episodes, that you should always select a broadcast channel to showcase your work. Ours happens to be Instagram for our company. We only maintain an Instagram. I don't maintain a Twitter. I don't really maintain much else other than LinkedIn and my contributory articles and stuff like that. But being really relevant in our spectrum of industry is really important to me. And really being relevant on my Instagram channel is really important to me as well, too. If you want to pay behind Instagram to have more visibility behind some algorithmic based sources, I think that's not a terrible idea. But if you're thinking about and considering paying for advertisement, be really cautious because again, I don't believe that any big decision on how much money is exchanged hands in the event world is really made off of a billboard or a static magazine ad. And that also goes to show that trade deals, I've done a lot of trade deals when I first started my company, do a lot of regional publications, I would not recommend doing that. Um, I've been a full page ad in probably 15 different magazines that are local and I've never got anything out of it. In fact, the only thing I ever got out of regional publications on full page free ads was a company that called me to sell me a copier and I currently have the copier. So I guess that's a win, but certainly not something worth paying for or exchanging $5,000 of in-kind services for a trade deal, like a, a deal in trade, right? Now, the one exception to this might be industry trade publications. Now, not our industry, but when you go around to the beverage industry, the petroleum industry, the automotive industry, and those are verticals where it's B2B industry magazines, that could be worthwhile to explore, right? But before you ever advertise at all, put yourself in the traditional client seat. And the problem with our industry and consulting in general is that a lot of times we don't consider ourselves as the wide-eyed doe client walking through a situation with really a little bit of information or understanding for what they're about to do and make business decisions against, right? And I want you to keep in mind a, a big client term that we use, and if you don't know this client term, please put it in your hat, it's called KPIs, right? Key Performance Indicators or Key Performance Indexes, right? People argue about what it actually stands for, but Key Performance Points. What's the point? What are your most valued things? And if you've got just write them all on paper. I want you to just make a list of everything you want. More money, more clients, cooler work, more stuff in broadcast. Name everything. And then I want you to organize that list by priority. That is your KPI list. So if anybody pitches you on an advertising product or how to get new clients because their magazine touches all these homes of so-and-so that's exactly your client, that's great. But make sure that it meets at least three KPIs. If it doesn't meet at least three KPIs, it's not worth doing unless it's free, but then you're talking about the trade deal again. And I also believe in no discounts. Personally, and I, I talk about trade discounts because it, it segues in that, I don't believe in anything for discount. Please don't do it. I recommend you don't. It'll undervalue and undercut your own service, your own brand, and your quality. If you want to sponsor something, give it away for free, right? If you want to sponsor the nonprofit of your dreams does the best work for kids that are really part of your heart, your life's work, do it for free or do a paid component and a free component. But I promise you discounts will only lead to a discount customer and more referred discounted customers. And that can probably be the, the biggest detriment to your business is underscoring your entire price structure and your value that you bring to the table. And that's a big no-no in my opinion from what I've seen. And quite honestly, I've had a lot of arguments about this, but when it came down to it, I've always had people say, you know what, that turned out to be true. And maybe it's not now, but it will be in the future. Do not discount your work. Again, the trade deal, it's fine. Analyze it if it's really worth it, but don't do discounts, right? Think about all these points we're making. Now, you have all this capital or limited capital that you need to allocate to certain initiatives. Before you start paying to advertise on Facebook, make sure your message is sound, your voice is solid, and make sure that whatever you're about to put out in the world is exactly what you want, and it hits on three KPIs for you. And again, 
Don't discount the work when it comes down to it. Even if they say, you know what, we can't afford this. Say, you know what, then I'm the wrong vendor for it. Or say, I can offer this component for free and this component is paid. That's what you can do and that's totally fair and it'll support your business in the long term. So let's talk about new business from strangers. This is kind of our, our, our departing point here because it sounds absurd to get new business from strangers. But this is really what's known as a, a PR strategy. Think about it. Any new product is on the market, whether it be in a, an away suitcase, that's the trendiest bag to bring on an airplane, right? Or it be any decision that you make from a GQ magazine, a billboard, or an advertisement that you saw, right? That's all just new business from strangers. I don't believe that away knows who that customer actually is from a face-to-face -face standpoint, but they have a customer profile, right? In our very first episode, we talked with Kimberly Montoya about creating that customer avatar and knowing who that is so you can properly direct your speech and, and kind of navigate that speech where you're speaking directly to that identified avatar of your dream client or customer profile, right? And there are three ways to garner new business from strangers and create a PR strategy of your own. And there are three positions that you can take. It's the curator, the creator, and the voice, right? The first is the curator. This is the easiest jump into bed with right now. The curator is to maintain a social broadcast channel that's very important and relevant to what you can maintain. And if you don't maintain it, don't start it. Because once you start it, you need to keep up with it or else the whole thing kind of falls apart, right? And this leads to the statement that we love the most, and that's, I found you on Instagram, or somebody sent me your Instagram. When you look up your insights on Instagram, you will notice as you start looking at viewing insights on a business profile of Instagram for free, it'll show you how many people came in from unique uh, uh, or, or non-friends, basically. People that don't know you, found your profile through hashtags, found you through homepage, what it might be but you can actually track those links and find out who met you from Instagram. I'd say half our interns come from our Instagram. They reach out cold. New business comes through Instagram. We actually have closed several deals. In fact, the most valuable one was worth over a million dollars from our Instagram by a message on Instagram and we responded. Very important that you curate impeccably. And again, put content out that represents what you would like to be doing in the future. If your portfolio consists of only weddings and you don't want to keep doing weddings, be cautious about how many weddings you put on your Instagram, even if that's all the work that you do right now. You need to curate content that is idealistic in nature to the degree of not putting out things that you don't want to continue to do. Because if you build a snowball, an attractive snowball that people want to be attracted to, you're just going to grow what you don't want to grow. In our world, for my company, we have about five different key verticals that we focus on, right? In these key verticals, uh, we mess ourselves differently. I bring different people to those meetings. We uh, have different positions. We have a different tone. Uh, you speak differently to a certain degree. You know, you dress different. More, I wear full suits for some clients, and I wear T-shirts for others because neither one wants to see me in the other person's attire. It's just not important to them. It's very important that you speak appropriately to these people. And through curating your Instagram, you will know your tone that you want to take with a broadcast client or with a corporate client, or with a social client. It's very different, and there's no right or wrong, but they do have different lanes, right? Now, there is also the creator. It's a much more editorial approach, where be rele being relevant in industry publications, writing for things like Eventpreneur, writing for things like BizBash, uh, Event Marketer, all these industry publications, you can have a voice, especially with the digital world we're in, especially now with COVID, you can be a guest writer. Just submit content. Stop being afraid of it. Write the damn article, Send it out. People want to hear your voice. You might not know what your voice sounds like until it resonates off of an industry publication and a strong voice of industry, and you'll find your voice through editorial. That's the creator voice. Then, of course, there is the actual one I'm calling the voice, and that's being an authority figure or beacon by starting or hosting leadership events that your audience uh, really can relate to with you as the star. It's similar to me in this event premier position right now. I'm garnering new followers because all of you are listening to me and whether or not you like my message, we're, 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 we're going through that where one meets two, two meets four, four meets 16, right? And being the voice of your own channel, of your own Instagram, you can do Instagram live every week and you can fold all this curator, creator, and voice into one thing that you do really well. And that ball of content is how your message gets out to the world. And that is how you create a PR strategy that makes new business from strangers. So I'm really excited to engage with everybody on this topic. I know that this is not 
a, 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 a passive subject matter. It's definitely not something that's, that's going to be a one size fits all. Sales is very prescriptive, okay? And if you hire somebody for sales distinctly, make sure that you also understand the category of salesperson that they are. And I got told this one time uh, when I was about 20 years old, I thought the guy was an idiot and I was mad that he gave me advice like this. And I was in sales working for a very large company, similar industry. And he said, you're either a hunter or you're a farmer. You can never be both. And to this day, I've never met a hunter and farmer combination that did it really well, right? And a hunter is somebody that finds new relationships and kills the new business and you know, whatever. And the farmer is somebody that nurtures the relationships. And oftentimes in an organization that's profitable and doing good work, you're gonna find both, a hunter, a farmer, and then somebody to kind of make everybody play nice, right? Uh, the shepherd, if you will, right? And what's great about that is that you have people that have distinct roles, somebody that's more aggressive to go find new leads, follow up on new leads, and somebody that's really there to nurture those clients that work slower or that work off that long-term relationship, right? And so I wanna make sure you guys don't forget about that, right? Build your sales team. If you're your sales team, think about what you don't do well. Like we talked about in our last episode, our second episode about accounting and finance, hire what you don't do well. If you're a great hunter, hire a farmer, right? If that's all you're looking for is new business, new business, new business, Find what you're not good at and hire that person, right? Cold calling is not a good idea probably in our industry. It's, it's just too big, too expensive, right? But again, hunter farmer mentality is really important. So I'm so excited to engage uh, today. I'm also excited to engage in the long term. So if you're seeing this later in life, please reach out. That's always a conversation around sales. It's always evolving really too. So it's something that's really important. And I hope that you all find success in growing your businesses so cheers to you in your future growth and finding new clients and new business within things you already knew and people that evangelize your business for you. Cheers.